Today we're going to be learning about protein metabolism. So what is protein and what does it do? Protein is one of three macronutrients our body needs. Proteins have many different roles in the body. They make up skin, hair, and help us build muscle mass and other neurotransmitters that mediate anxiety. It is important that we eat the right amounts of protein in order to stay healthy. Proteins are made up of amino acids that are linked together by peptide bonds. They contain an amine group, a carboxyl group, and a side chain that distinguishes that amino acid. Amino acids can be classified into two categories, essential and non-essential. Essential amino acids cannot be synthesized by the body and must be obtained in the diet. They can easily be memorized by the mnemonic device, Private Tim Hall. They are phenylalanine, valine, threonine, tryptophan, isoleucine, methionine, histidine, arginine, lysine, and leucine. However, the non-essential amino acids can be synthesized by a process called transamination that we'll discuss later. Some foods, called complete proteins, contain all the essential amino acids in the correct proportion that the body needs. Some examples of complete proteins are eggs and meats. Incomplete proteins lack one or more of the essential amino acids. Most plants are incomplete proteins. It's important that vegetarians and vegans monitor their protein intake in order to get all the essential amino acids. Some good options for them would be quinoa or soybeans. So what happens when we eat protein? The breakdown of food is initiated in the mouth by the chewing of teeth. This is called mechanical digestion. The bolus of food moves down the elementary canal to the stomach. This is where enzymes called proteases begin to chemically break down the food. Hydrochloric acid is released by the parietal cells of the stomach. A hormone called gastrin is released to stimulate pepsinogen release as well as more hydrochloric acid. The acid and pepsinogen combine to form pepsin, an endopeptidase that helps break peptide bonds in the middle of the chain. The acidic environment of the stomach allows us to kill bad bacteria in the stomach before passing the chyme along. When the chyme leaves the stomach, it must be neutralized by a bicarb secretion from the pancreas upon entrance to the small intestine. This allows the zymogens to be released as a result of CCK. Trypsinogen is activated by enterokinase and release, results in trypsin. Trypsin activates the two other zymogens that help further break down the protein. At the brush board of the jejunum, we are left with amino acids as well as some dientripeptides. These enter the enterocyte via different transporters. Inside the enterocyte, all remaining dientripeptides are broken down into amino acids, which leave the cell and travel to the liver via the hepatic portal vein. In the liver, the amino acids can either undergo transamination or oxidative deamination. Transamination allows the body to synthesize other non-essential amino acids to build muscle, for example. The amine group that contains nitrogen is cleaved off and is held by PLP, a vitamin B6 cofactor. A new carbon skeleton picks up that amine group with the help of transaminases. The original carbon skeleton is then free to go pick up another amine group as well to form a new amino acid. It is critical that we have healthy amounts of B6 to undergo transamination, and this process will ideally happen 85% of the time. The other process, known as oxidative deamination, breaks down our amino acids for fuel. This can be helpful during exercise, but we only want to utilize this pathway 10-15% to of the time. It can also happen more frequently in people who are metabolically inflexible. They begin to break down their muscle tissue into glucose for fuel. Like in transamination, the amine group is held by PLP, leaving us with the carbon skeleton. However, in oxidative deamination, an enzyme called glutamate dehydrogenase burns that carbon skeleton down into glucose to give us energy. We also make a new amino acid called glutamate from the alpha-ketoglutarate carbon backbone. Glutamate can hold one nitrogen group. When we have an excess of nitrogen, synthesis from glutamate to glutamine occurs. This is because glutamine can carry two nitrogen groups. This conversion suppresses GABA, an inhibitory neurotransmitter that has calming effects on the body. This repression can lead to anxiety. The enzyme glutamate dehydrogenase also converts glutamate into ammonia. Ammonia is the toxic waste product that results from the degradation of nitrogen from amine groups. The toxic ammonia must be converted to ammonia ion, ammonium ion, then to urea for eventual excretion from the urinary system. Too much ammonia can overwhelm the liver and will accumulate in the blood and cross the blood-brain barrier, causing edema. There's many lenses to look at protein consumption from. One of them is from an athletic perspective. Athletes who want to gain muscle mass and become leaner should be mindful of their protein intake. They should calculate their goal weight and their daily protein consumption. Amount of protein per day is based off of lean body mass and activity factor. If they don't have enough protein, it could hinder them from gaining muscle. Excess protein gets degraded via oxidative deamination, leading to higher amounts of ammonia. Protein can also have lipogenic effects with high insulin protein containing ketogenic amino acids such as lysine and leucine, which are very common in protein drinks. 
They can be broken down and stored as triglycerides with high insulin and fat, which is something to watch out for. With lower insulin, it can become a ketone in the blood that can be used to fuel and stimulate fat burning. I would encourage athletes to obtain most of their protein from the diet via complete protein sources as well.